morning, everyone. God be with you. And also with you. I'd like to welcome you here to Brunswick First United Methodist Church. And we're getting really close to Holy Week and Easter, and I'm really excited. We have lots of special um, services planned this year. And I'm really looking forward to sharing this time with you all. It's, we've got different events planned we have in the past, and so it should be wonderful. Um, Easter lilies will be placed in the sanctuary on Easter Sunday. In addition to being beautiful, the lilies will have an active role in our service on Easter morning. So if you would like to buy a lily, the insert is in your bulletin. If you'll fill that out and you can put it in the offering plate, or you can call Melinda in the church office and reserve your lily. We're just trying to get the orders placed by March the 25th, and it'll, you know, you know how we bring them in and everything. It'll be really beautiful. Um, so now let's highlight the opportunities of the week here within the church. I'd like to thank the Seekers class this morning for providing the refreshments for the meet and greet. Mm -hmm. I teach the middle schoolers, and I don't know, I think they went down there and ate everything down there. But they really loved it, so hopefully everybody else got some food too. So thank you very much. The Youth Praise Band will be meeting this evening at 5 o'clock, followed by MYF and Snack Supper at 5.30. And the gathering place, you know, is providing our devotionals for the kids, so y'all please come on back tonight. We have a new support group um, meeting. It's um, for people affected by chronic illness. The group will be meeting this evening at 5.30 in the Welcome Center, and they'll kind of be getting organized to, to discuss the best meeting style for, for this group. So if you'd like to come, that's tonight at 5.30. Family night dinners are continuing on Wednesday at 545. We're up to um, about the second half of chapter 10. We'll be doing 10, 11, and part of 12 on Wednesday. We would love for you to all come and join us. You just need to either call the church office by Monday at noon, or you can just pay for your meal and drop your check in the offering plate. It's been a wonderful study and very eye-opening, so I encourage you all to, to come on back. And I'm sure that you're all aware that March Madness is going on. I know the TV is on a lot in my house, and I have a man in my house who is constantly checking all the scores. It's kind of driving me crazy. But we here in the church are going to have our own March Madness next Sunday. We'll be hosting it over at the Old Wood Gym, which is directly behind us, you know, across the gravel parking lot. Our men's softball team, that way, I, I don't know where I am. You know, the Old Wood Gym, just right across the street. That way. And... Um, like I said, I never know where I am. But um, anyway, the men's softball team will be playing our youth and children. And I know we have a really good men's softball team, but I don't know if they can move on the basketball court. So I think I'm going to put my money with the kids, and it's going to be a family event. We encourage you all to come and just give in to the March Madness and come on back. We'll be having um, the basketball game will be at 3 o'clock. Um, they'll play from 3 to 3.45. The gathering place is going to provide us with a short devotional from 3.45 to 4. And at 4 o'clock, then we're going to have different relays and games going on. And after all that exercise, we're going to be hungry, so we have to eat some hot dogs. So we'll have hot dogs and door prizes. So, you know, if you can't play basketball, please come sit in the stands. That'll be next Sunday. So y'all please come, plan to come on back for that. Um, I would like to offer a special um, happy anniversary to the Corbett's, to Philip and Elizabeth Corbett. Today is their 34th wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary. <laughs> And now let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship.
57, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. singing Charles Wesley's great, great hymn, and you will hear me refer from time to time to the strength of that verse that says, he breaks the power of canceled sin. Remain standing, if you will, for the, our affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed found at page 881 in the hymnal for our visitors. Let us unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Please be seated for just a moment. Do we have anybody visiting with us today who's a very first-time visitor? If we have first-time visitors, what we want you to do is just simply raise your hand, and we've got a gift bag for you. Anybody who's a very first-time visitor? Good, okay. Thank you. Now, y'all, 
I'm requesting this morning um, some physical protection from the Brown family. The University of Kentucky, which is known for its basketball, beat the University of South Carolina two days in a row, four to three on Friday to Saturday. So I'm looking for some protection from the Browns this morning, okay? Stand to greet someone and tell them you're glad to see them standing next to you this morning. And now if you will all register your attendance on the pad on the end of your pew. And when that pad comes back, please glance it over. Make sure that you know by name the people that you're sitting with. The altar flowers today are given by Ann Hathaway in loving memory of Doug Hathaway. This, um, their 60th wedding anniversary would have been March 19th. Um, in the local hospital here as of Thursday morning, we had no one. In, at St. Charles in Jacksonville is Autumn Leaf Howell and Scottish Rite Hospital, Children's Hospital in Atlanta. This is an update on um, Victoria Elizabeth Hughes. Victoria is doing well and may be out of the hospital in the next several days. She'll return for more operations over the next few weeks. At Sears Manor, we have Annette Simpson. And if we can please continue to pray for our service personnel, Scotty Bennett, John Patrick Thornton, Brian Hayes, Eric Friedrich, Charles Wells, A.J. Schaefer, and Lauren Maynard, and our missionaries in the field, the Lovelace, Great House, Shirouse, and Trousdale families. Do we have any other prayer concerns? Tad Tostison and family? And Savannah. Jackie Masson. Katie Federer. Jacksonville? Okay, Autumn is at Wolfson in Savannah, in Jacksonville. <laughs> I just, I repeat what I hear. <laughs> Pardon? Okay, the McPhee. Reverend Joe Glisson. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we'll take a few moments to pray silently. And if you'd like to come to this altar to lift up a special burden, we invite you to do so. And then we'll unite our hearts together in praying. Will you bow with me as we pray? Father God, we're grateful on this and other Lord's Day for the privilege of coming to this house of worship. We thank you for the challenge that we heard uh, last week from our United Methodist women, and we thank you for their leadership in our church and in the world and in the work of the church that the United Methodist Church is involved in. And Father, we're grateful. We're grateful for those who hear your call and respond to it and move in obedient faith, Father, to go where you lead and to go where sent. And Lord, we're grateful because this morning we're going to look at a church that obeyed you and was faithful to the very end. And we're grateful for faithfulness and obedience in the life and the work of the kingdom. Father, you have heard the requests that have been lifted up this morning for those that are having surgeries. And uh, Father, for those who need uh, a personal touch in their bodies, we're, we're grateful, Lord, that you are a God who hears us and loves us and touches us. And Father, you are the one that we can commit our ills to. You are the one who hears our prayers and meets us at the point of our need. 
And Lord, every one of us have come into this sanctuary this morning looking for something, maybe looking for someone. And Father, we pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what you have for us and to the person that you want us to meet face to face this morning. And we pray that as we go through this season of Lent and enter into Easter, Holy Week and Easter, Lord, that you would bless our hearts again with that truth that we celebrate every year at this time. And yet, Lord, it is as new and as fresh as our morning devotions. It is as new and as fresh as the Word of God, which we'll read this morning. And we pray that you would make it real to our hearts and to our daily living. Now, Father, hear these requests that have been lifted up and meet them, we pray. And we pray that you would meet each need that comes into this sanctuary. Father, we pray these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who taught us in his disciples' prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Mrs. Claudia to come forward and to share our children's message with us this morning. Oh, well, ask the children to come down. The children need to come down front. I'm sorry. The invitation to all the children to come down front and meet Miss Claudia. How is everybody? Good. I'm glad to be here today. Now, I brought something with me. I think y'all are so smart. A baby bottle. Now, tell me what baby bottles are used for. Feeding babies. Because when babies are little, this is about all the baby can do. No chips, no pizza, no hamburgers. They just no macaroni gosh that's terrible so this is how babies get their nutrition and what happens to babies who drink a bottle and do what they're supposed to they they grow and they stay healthy that's right and then they grow up and are able to eat chips and then they can eat macaroni that is correct now do you know that in the Bible God through some people who wrote the books of the Bible, tells us that when we start out as his children, we start out kind of like babies. We start out with spiritual milk, and we drink spiritual milk. And, you know, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about you because all of y'all are kind of big to drink out of a bottle. But I know that most of you go to Sunday school, and in Sunday school you spend a lot of time learning stories that are in the Bible, right? Um, I know that y'all were studying the same story that we studied today. That was when Jesus got a little upset with what was going on in his church and he kind of had a fit. Did you say that today? Oh, last week, sorry. But God doesn't want us to stay babies just like babies don't need to stay babies. God wants us to grow up and to move on from spiritual milk. So as you grow up, and as we grown-ups grow up, we're moving away from the spiritual milk, and we are learning bigger things. We still talk about the stories in the Bible, but we also read the Bible and listen for the Holy Spirit to tell us things that we need to hear and to teach us things. And it's a little bit 
if we haven't had the spiritual milk like we had, like you're having in Sunday school, it's hard for us to understand. But because God made it the way he did, spiritual milk turns into spiritual big food, like big comfort food like macaroni. And the Bible grows with us. The Bible, God's word is alive and active, and it doesn't stay the same, and each one of us learn different lessons. So I want you to remember, when you're in Sunday school or when you're at home and you're talking about Bible stories in the Bible, you are growing every time you talk about it. And God's, God's uh, goal is that we would grow up and that we would become mature Christians and mature spiritually and be able to read the Bible and understand it even better because we grew up in it. So let's bow our heads and thank God. God, we thank you for your word. Did y'all forget what to do? You're supposed to talk. God, we thank you for your word, for the stories of your people, for our Sunday school teachers and our parents and other people who teach us those stories. Give us wisdom to grow in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of preparation number 573, O Zion Haste.
come forward to receive our morning offering will you join me as we ask God's blessing upon our giving Father we're reminded of the words of this old hymn give of thy wealth to speed them on their way there is still a world that needs to know what we know there's a world that needs to know whom we know we pray that we might be about the work of your kingdom in spreading the truth of your gospel we pray in Jesus name bless these tithes and offerings that caused that to happen. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated.
please stand for the reading of our scripture today. We're reading from Revelation 3, 7 through 13 on the faithful church. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This came across my desk and I want to share it with you. It seems that there was this minister who just had all of his remaining teeth pulled and new dentures were being made. The first Sunday, he only preached 10 minutes. The second Sunday, he preached only 20 minutes. But on the third Sunday, he preached one hour and 25 minutes. When asked about this by some of the congregation he responded this way the first Sunday my gums were so sore it hurt to talk the second Sunday my dentures were hurting a lot still the third Sunday I accidentally grabbed my wife's dentures and I couldn't stop talking <laughs> yes you can get a copy of that we are visiting the next to the last church today, the church at Philadelphia. Now next week, which will be the last Sunday in March, we will visit the Laodicean church, the last church in the messages to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And uh, we'll be done with our traveling. After Easter, I want to start a series on the Lord's Prayer. And so we hope to do that. But this morning, we're at the next to the last church. And what a good service we had uh, we had last week with Laurie Joe Upchurch. She did a wonderful job, and the UMW did a wonderful job in uh, leading in the uh, leading in the service. During the nine o'clock service, I shared from Matthew 24 and 25, and I I told this story that it is very close to my heart because a couple of years ago I was invited by the Gideon representative that we had as a member at the church that I was serving at that time to go to Callaway Gardens at Pine Mountain to hear the international president of the Gideons speak. And it was a challenging message. It was, it was a very challenging message and just thoroughly soul-stirring. And we came away from that meeting as, as uh, the Gideon camp. Now, you know, I don't know if you know or, or not, but the Gideons is a lay movement. And, of course, they depend upon support from churches and, and your giving to, to see that the work of the Gideons uh, is carried out in publishing the gospel, printing and publishing the gospel around the world in every language that they possibly can. But the, the international president told of a Gideon representative in Russia. Now, if you can think of such a thing, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the Gideon movement has taken off like wildfire, like some churches have. We have Methodist churches that are growing in Russia. The Pentecostal movement is particularly strong and the charismatic movement in Russia. But a Gideon speaker um, was a, a young man attached himself to him who was a member of the National Guard for a former member of the National Guard uh, for Russia. And he flew uh, a MiG, an old MiG-25, I think. Oh, I'm not, don't forget the number. I forget what it is. It's an old, an old MiG. But he offered the services of that MiG to carry Gideon Bibles into villages in North Russia. And it was a particularly cold time of the year, and so they loaded, if you can imagine this, and the president of the Gideons was saying how it stirred his heart to hear this story. 
but they were loading boxes of Bibles into the bomb bay of the old MIG. And they took off and flew. It's just a two-person plane, and they took off and flew to one village, and they stopped, and they handed out boxes of Bibles to the, to the pastors in those churches. And then they took off again, and they flew a little further north, and they took some more boxes out of the bomb bay and gave them to the church leaders. And then they flew a little further north. He said they made about five different stops. And finally, they got to the place, the last village they handed out, and they still had a couple of boxes left. And he said, well, let's, let's go to the next village north. And the man said this, the young flyer for the Russian Air Force said this. He said, there are no more villages to the north. He said, we're above the Arctic Circle, and you are at the end of the world. And the Gideon representative said it just brought to his heart and mind what the word said, that the Lord would not come back until the gospel was published to the ends of the earth. Now, I believe that the message to this church that we're going to see this morning, the Philadelphia church, the text of which Monica's read for us, is the next to the last church. It is and corresponds to that period in history that has some unique characteristics to it. But the hallmark characteristic of this church, of the Philadelphian church, is the fact that it took to heart the great commission that the Lord gave us as a church. And it was known as a church that spread the gospel. Now, not only was the, the actual Philadelphian church known for this, and as you, if you'll remember, I said that this, there, were, there were a couple of churches for which uh, the Lord had only good things to say, but he has absolutely no criticism for this church, for the Philadelphian church. Now, I believe that this period in church history corresponds to a time around the late 16, early 1700s, up until fairly recently. Now, we'll look next week at the Laodicean church, which I think is representative of the church of the end of time before the Lord comes back again. How long could that be? Well, I don't know, and nobody does, and I'm certainly not going to make a prediction. My son told me now that we're on YouTube with our videos, and Jim Rich and Jim Weldy are working on that, and you can go online, and you can go on YouTube and view our church services and our, Sunday, our Wednesday night Bible studies. And <clears throat> my young son in America said, Dad, you need to say something really outrageous so that your video will go viral on uh, YouTube. Well, I'm not looking to go viral on, uh, on YouTube. But with the advent of technology, we find that the gospel is reaching everywhere. You know, if you've, looked, if you've ever looked at a timeline, with the advancement of technology with regard to recorded history, and, and we go back 4,000, maybe 5,000 years before the time of Christ, a lot of debate on that, but roughly the time of the beginning of recorded history until the 17 and the 1800s with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, you find that technology is almost a flat line. And then suddenly the Industrial Revolution hits in Western Europe and it just goes off the charts. And we live in a day of videos and we live in a day of the digital age. And we live in a day when transportation has grown exponentially. And, and it's just easy to get anywhere that we want to go in the world, including the very roof of the world, K2, or Mount Everest. We can get there if we want. Not without certain difficulties, you understand, but nevertheless, we can go anywhere. We can take explorers down to the depths of the Mindanao Trench, in the Philippines, seven miles deep in the ocean. We could go anywhere. Now, what caused, what caused this church to be called the faithful church, the loving church? What caused this church? What were the characteristics of this church that made it like it was? And the first point that I want you to see this morning, and if you're filling in the blank on the, on, in the church, in the newsletter there that you have, the worship bulletin, I want you to see, first of all, that this church had opportunities that the other churches did not have. This church had opportunities that the other churches did not have. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, Jesus said in the message to this church, he said, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut. This church had the opportunity to go places and to do things with the truth of the gospel that no other church in church history had. And I, I want to share a couple of these things with you this morning, a couple of significant moments 
in the lives of great people that turn the course of church history. And one I want to share with you this morning is, is a missionary, a Scottish missionary by the name of Robert Moffat. And I, I wear the, the, uh, the plaid of the, of the Scottish clans that was adopted in 1300, around the 1300s. Uh, the Scottish clans and septs adopted, which you, you had to, your, your tartan had to be passed by the clans way back at this time and recognized for the different septs and the clans uh, of the families and the colors and so on that were used and the weavings that were used. And about that time, they adopted a plaid for the clergy. And uh, so clergy of any clan were permitted to wear this plaid that I wear this morning, and, and uh, it crossed the boundaries of the clans because of the clergy being called to preach the gospel. And, uh, and so I wear it this morning. It's supposed to be, according to Scottish history, appropriate to wear on any occasion uh, except when white is required. So you may see me wear this at odd, at odd times throughout the year. But I wear it this morning in honor of Robert Moffat. Now, Robert Moffat was a wonderful man of God. He was, he was a Methodist, an early Methodist in the early 1800s who got in trouble with his employer for his Methodist beliefs. He was hired by a man who was an Anglican, and, and at that time, the Methodist movement was still new enough that it was almost regarded as a cult in England. And, uh, and Robert Moffat really got into trouble with his employer. But this was a man of God, a preacher of the Word, a man who had studied God's Word. And he felt God calling him and eventually made his home in South Africa and there changed the course of a nation, literally, by the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But from time to time, in the 1840s and 50s and 60s and so on, Robert Moffat would travel to Scotland because, you see, like every missionary, he depended upon support from the home base. And so one night he was called to preach at a great Scottish Presbyterian church. The weather was cold. He was home on furlough. And uh, the weather was cold. He was hoping that night to stir men. And his passage was Proverbs 8 and verse 4. Unto you, O men of Israel, I call. And that was his text for the night. Well, when he got to the church to preach, there were just a handful of little old ladies. Can I say little old ladies? That's all that were there that night. He was so discouraged because he had a great missionary sermon prepared. And God was beginning to move in wonderful ways with the missionary movement. Unbeknownst to Robert Moffat, there's a young man of about 10, 11 years of age, and he's in the choir, in the organ loft. His mother is the church organist, and she's there to play for the hymns. But you see, it was an old pump-style organ. I played one of those. They're very interesting. And he is underneath pushing the pedals of the organ. His mother wasn't strong enough to push the pedals anymore, to build up the air in the bellows, to produce the sound. And so here's this little boy, 10 years of age, pumping the bellows for his mother to play the organ. And these few ladies gathered to hear this great preacher from South Africa, South Africa, if you've ever been there. And he preached his heart out. And you know what? That little boy heard. He heard what was being said. And the word of God got into his heart at 10 years of age. And he became the greatest medical missionary that ever lived and also helped to change the fate of a continent. Do you know what his name was? David Livingston. David Livingston. And David Livingston later ended up marrying Robert Moffat's daughter, Mary. And you know some of that history, how God used that man to change a nation and to reach others. Oh, my. This church had opportunities. God said, I'm setting before you an open door that no man can shut. It's your opportunity to move through it and to plant the gospel in ways that no other church has ever had in history. Now, the second thing that I want you to notice this morning is that because of their strength, this church at Philadelphia, because of their strength, they persevered. And you say, what do you mean by that? What kind of strength did they, did they have? It almost sounds like a, like a little bit of a derogatory statement when Jesus says here, I know that you have a little strength, but 
It's one of those statements that means I know that you've got some strength. I know that you have strength there. What kind of strength are we talking about? We're talking about the strength of faith that permits us to stand for Christ and not deny his name when given the opportunity. And this church had that kind of strength, the strength of their faith. And if you've ever taken time to read those passages in Hebrews 11 and 12, where you read that great honor roll of heaven, those who were faithful, those who believed, they're the Moseses and the Davids and some of the great names from Israel's past. And, and the writer to the Hebrews who's trying to help new Christians understand their relationship to the Old Testament, the Hebrew faith and to Jehovah of the Old Testament, says to them that Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. The strength of faith, the strength of faith will cause you to commit. It will cause you to love. It will cause you to serve God to the very best of your ability. And the Philadelphian church had that strength. There is a group of young men whose names I will never forget. I walk out here and I'm going to do this from memory. 1952, the year that I was born, four young men, two of them Wheaton College graduates, met in Ecuador. They belonged to an organization called MML, many MLM, Many Land Missions, or something like that. I forget exactly the name of it. But they found out about a tribe. They were there serving. They'd been there serving four years. And in 1956, they, they heard about a tribe that was in the interior, a tribe of primitive native Ecuadorians who would shoot the shell oil workers with bows and spears and so on and, and generally create havoc and that wanted no intrusion from the outside whatsoever. And God laid upon the heart of these young men that he was setting before them an open door to take the gospel to these people. And a young man by the name of Nate Saint, whose father was a flyer with Mission Aviation Fellowship, had an airplane and they would take this airplane over this village and they would drop things that they knew the native natives could use like axe heads and blankets and things like that hoping for some open door that would give them the opportunity to share Jesus with these people and on that fateful day in 1956 they felt it was time and I want to tell you this morning God was opening a door And they didn't understand the sacrifice that they would have to make for that door to be open. And Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Roger Udarian took off in a plane that was way overloaded. And they landed on a sandbar near this village on an Ecuadorian river. And y'all, they had a rifle for wild beasts because they're pretty mean wild cats in the jungles of Ecuador. And they had a rifle with two bullets in it that they could have used, but they didn't. And before that day was over, and if you have ever read the book Beyond, uh, Through Gates of Splendor, by Elizabeth Elliot, or if you've ever seen the movie Point of the Spear. And if you've never seen either, you need to get them. You need to go to the video store, go to Blockbuster today, and rent Point of the Spear. It's the incredible story of these five young men, and before the day was over, all five of their bodies lay on that riverbank. And those who went days later could circle overhead and see their dead bodies, and it took two weeks for them to be able to go in and bring them out. And I want to tell you what Pete Fleming's father wrote in his journal on the day that they realized and confirmed that his son had died. They all died at the point of a spear or, or an arrow. He wrote that day in his journal. He said, Lord, give me the opportunity before I die of having communion 
with the men who killed my son. And I want to tell you that before a full year passed, that they were able to get into that village. They're called the Huarani. They call themselves the Huarani. Their neighbors call them the Aka Indians. And before that year was over, they were in that village. Today, there is a huge church, a thriving church in that village. And a, a man who today is an elder, and you'll see his testimony on the movie if you'll get it, who testified to being the one who put the spear into Nate Saint. And he is today a preacher of the gospel. This time in history, including the Wesleys, George Whitfield, Robert Strawbridge, Bishop Strawbridge, in America, it was the pioneer front. It was a time of revivals. It was a time when the wind of the Spirit of God moved across churches, particularly Methodist churches at this time. And God brought revival. Now, you know, sometimes when we talk about revival, and I heard a Methodist preacher not too long ago on TV he talk about revival, and he said, our, our revivalism sometimes tends to scare people off in the Methodist church. I want to tell you, when I was a senior at Asbury College, and I just briefly relate this, David Yarborough, who pastors at the community church, I've heard, has uh, often referred to the Asbury Revival. He went to Asbury Seminary. In 1970, I will never forget the day. I was a senior at Jessamine County High School. I was the janitor for Dr. Dennis Kinlaw. My dad was the dean of men at Asbury College. I was a janitor on the campus. One of my responsibilities was to clean Dr. Kinlaw's office. He was gone preaching in Canada. His office at that time was in the old Morrison Library at Asbury. And I was talking to Camille Jackson, his secretary. She was and is a close family friend. And we were just chatting before I was going in to clean Dr. Kinlaw's office that day, get my chores done early. You see, it had snowed during the night. And at Justman County, Kentucky, when we get a little skiff of snow on the ground, they'd call off school now the reason was because there were some steep roads out at the river and there had been a horrific accident in which a lot of children had died years and years ago so they don't take any chances when there's any little ice or snow and they call school off that day on that Thursday school was off it was a day that chapel took place Asbury had chapel then Tuesday Thursdays and Saturdays and I'll never forget talking to Miss Camille and a student came running in the double, the big old wooden double doors at Morrison Seminary, ran into the library, and he shouted, Friends, you don't shout in the library. You don't shout in the library at Asbury. You'll get shipped. And this student shouted. He said, Y'all need to go over to Hughes Auditorium and see what's happening. And Camille and I walked over there, and I will never forget it till the day that I die. I, I've prayed often over the years, Lord, was that a once-in-a-life experience, once-in-a-lifetime experience? And I think maybe it was. I will never forget walking up the steps to Hughes Auditorium outside through the snow and walked in those doors and looked at the front. And y'all, where we've got this altar, there's a big, huge, curved altar at the front of Hughes Auditorium. And this altar was lined with students. And they were kneeling out here three and four deep. And we stood back in the back and looked. And I saw a line of students coming up around the back of the, of, uh, to, to the chancel and up to the pulpit waiting to get to the microphone to share their testimony of what God had been doing on campus. And y'all, for three weeks, for three weeks, there were no classes there was nothing but revival. There was no wildness. There, was, there may have been a little hand raising. wasn't much of that. There was no craziness. It wasn't a circle. It was just people coming face to face with Jesus. And lives were changed. They picked it up on the NBC News, CBS. All the major networks carried this thing. And people came from all over the country. And I will never forget, for the most of that next three weeks, I was up there sometimes in the middle of the night. You just wanted to be where God was. And you knew he was in that place at that time. And I'll never forget standing with a lady in the back as she came in some, from some state out west Iowa or something. And she came in and she stood there. And just in the presence, 
And there wasn't anything particular happening on. Oh, every now and then somebody would get up and lead the song to God be the glory or a great hymn from the Cokesbury hymnal. And sharing testimonies. And she stood there and tears started to come down. I watched her. She took her shoes off. <laughs> she took her shoes off. And walked in there and sat down and enjoyed being in the presence of God. She knew she was on holy ground. You see, this was the characteristic of this church. They knew they had been given a holy commission. They took it to heart. They obeyed, and they carried the gospel around the world. And they had the advantage of the print media, and they had the advantage of sailing ships and steamer ships, and they had the advantage of diesel ships, and now airplanes and the gospel was being spread around the world. Jesus said, I have set before you an open door and, and no man can shut it. And if you're going to be faithful and obedient to the commission that I've given you, then you're going to walk through that door. And they did. Now here's what the Lord wanted this church to do. And the third thing that I want to lift up to you. The Lord wanted this church like you to hold on. He wanted this church like you to hold on. Listen, what makes you want to quit on something? What is it that makes you want to give up? Is it a broken relationship? Is it because somebody lied to you? Is it because somebody's been unfaithful to you? What is it that causes you to want to quit? What breaks my heart is when people want to quit on God. Because you see, He didn't quit on you. He didn't quit for you including that last week that led to the cross. The last thing that I want you to notice this morning as we close, the reward for this church would be, isn't this distinctive? Isn't this like the Lord? He says the reward would be no more going out and a new name. You see, these are people, this period of time was known, and I, I could share with you personal family Stories. I, I remember the story of my great-grandma Bell and my grandmother McElrath standing on a, on a pier in New York City watching my aunt and uncle, Dorothy and Lois neighbors, Lois and Bill neighbors, their goods packed in three 55-gallon drum, metal drums, on a, stamp, a tramp steamer heading to Thailand. In war-devastated Thailand in 1948, and my great-grandma, even though she prayed, for her relatives to go to the mission, shield, mission field, cried and cried and cried. She just cried her eyes out, thinking she'd never see them again. You see, this was a church that gave. This was a church that sent. This was a church that walked through an open door. And their reward would be, Jesus said, I'll make you pillars in my temple. And there'll be no more going out. You won't need to go out anymore. And when we get to that passage in Revelation 21 and 22, and we'll get there on Wednesday night Bible study, we'll see that when he sets up his kingdom on earth, he will be in his capital city of Jerusalem, and the world will come to him. And there'll be no need of light in it, because he is the light. He is the light. The reward would be no more going out and a new name a new name and after all isn't that what we want to see people have when they hear the truth of the gospel the Lord said I'll give you a new name and write your name in the Lamb's book of life and I just challenge you this morning as we go from here is your name in the Lamb's book of life as we close this service this morning, I want us to sing just one verse, not all the verses, not all the verses. Number 454 is, open my eyes that I may see. And here, here was the challenge of the Philadelphian church, not just to open its eyes, but to open its mouth. The open door was to take the gospel, to preach the gospel, to be faithful to it, not deny his name. And oh, Lord, I want us to be like the church in Philadelphia. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Just the last verse in closing. Will you stand as we sing it together? The third verse.
Brunswick is a church that loves each other. I want them to be able to point to us and say, look how they, how they love each other. But more than that, more than that, I want folks to be able to look at Brunswick First Methodist and say, you know, they love the Lord so much that they're willing to share it. They love the Lord so much that they're willing to share it. Lord, as we go from this place, we pray that we might be as faithful and as loving as the Philadelphia church was in Jesus' name. Thank you.